You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Welcome back to Crimson Cast. Neil and Clavio are joining you here along with Scott Caulfield as we're kind of not having a great technical day, to say the least. I am on AirPods. Scott has barely been able to uh, get his audio connected to me. And so this could be maybe the worst sounding podcast we've done since the Egyptian hackers. Scott, like, it, I mean, we're, we're talking about that era at this point. There's also the world where this just never gets released and you and I are talking for 30 minutes. So we can just go ahead and let's go True. all conspiracy theories out. Like, what are your thoughts on uh... a... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I don't want to piss bl- anybody off, so I'm not even going to pick I, up one example. Uh, yeah, no, we could talk about the the dolphins and show Walter Fountain or something. No, not really. But yeah, uh, yeah. no, we're we we're hitting part two of what is rapidly turning into a multi part um, uh, Q and A with you folks in the audience. So we had some other questions. If you listen to part one, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you should go back and listen to part one. We're going to do part two here. Hit some of the the more fun or more interesting questions that we saw in that mix. Uh, so we're going to get to that right away. First of all, just a reminder, we're brought to you by Home Field Apparel, your place to go for the finest in college fashions, the softest fabrics, the coolest designs. Uh, they are loading up for racing season. Got some IndyCar stuff dropping soon. I think there'll be some Little 5 stuff dropping. Uh, it's already dropped, and, and some more stuff will, I think, maybe be coming at some point soon. Use the code HOME23. Get 15% off your first order. Maybe go get one of those UConn back-to-back national title hoodies if you're an IU fan. It's the least that you can do. Again, yeah. homefieldapparel.com. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, also, just a reminder, we're on Substack. Go to crimsoncast.substack.com. Sign up for free. Get your podcast delivered right to your email inbox. And uh, if you'd like to support the podcast financially, we have a way to do that as well. So, uh, Scott. Without further ado, first of all, how are you? Is it is it as rainy up there as it is down here in Bloomington right now? Not really. It's misting. Although uh, I feel bad. I'm watching my kids get off the bus. My youngest son get off the bus without an umbrella, so he's a little unhappy. So he might have a different take on it. But no, it's not. It's not too bad here. A little cloudy. It would be, by the way, I uh, I watched part of your Instagram video. I, Instagram is great. You driving around, but like I wanted to see you get to the stadium, but it's like I had to do something else. It's like then I I couldn't go back. I didn't want to watch like another ten minutes like to get there. It's like I wish there was a, a scroll back and forth. Anyway, the eclipse. I know you lived through it. Like I lived through it. It was um that was awesome. Like that was a was. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. We had done the partial in 2017. Uh, no joke for the audience. I hung out with my neighbors. We did an eclipse party in the in the middle of the cul-de-sac, but it was um. That was unbelievable, and like I get why ancient cultures thought that was a big deal. That was it was it really cool. So for everybody who was able to enjoy it, I hope you did. And it, it literally afterwards it was like being on Space Mountain. And, like I want to do it again. Like like when when can we go to like Portugal in twenty twenty four twenty forty eight? Like it was it was awesome. Curious how your your take on it was. It was a similar take, uh, and yes, you just became one of those eclipse people. That yes. drives around or flies around the country and, and just goes to eclipse. You can see why that's an allure. And I was the same way that you were. Um, I, I think I put this on Instagram. Like I, uh, I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic at heart. And you know, whenever you see this amount of of ballyhoo around an event, you're always a little bit skeptical if you're a cynical person. But I was really blown away. It was a really special experience. And again, I mean, I, I likely will not be around for the next one here, but I might not be here when the next one happens where I'm at. And so maybe it'll all even out. But it was definitely a cool experience. My, my only takeaway from it is like in history, before there were, you know, glasses and people who knew and you just didn't know it was happening. I know. It, it, people had to just lose their vision. Because if you don't know what's yeah. going on, you're just going to look at it like, oh, that's cool. And it's like, it's like I'm, there had to just be a swap of blind people or people with jacked up vision across solar I, eclipse paths in the in the in previous history i had a similar thought while it was happening i was like well how did you know how, at what point was it established that looking directly at the sun was a bad idea i'm always yeah. I'm, I'm interested where in, in the development of human history they were like we should probably not be staring directly at this incredibly bright object um, yeah so it, it, anyway it was, um, it was funny we had a group we had like you know 20 kids in our neighborhood and i knew it was going to happen it's like we're watching like you know 
totality. It's like, oh, this is awesome. It's awesome. And all of a sudden, it's like, kids, glasses. Like, kids, right now, glasses, glasses. Like, once it starts cutting out, it's like, no, right now, right now, glasses, now. Like, stop. Well, I think the biggest thing that we noticed was um, the dogs. There were several dogs at the yeah. place that I was watching it at. And they all got real, like, eerily quiet during the eclipse itself, like, during the totality part. So, um I don't know that that means anything. They were probably just like, why is it dark all of a sudden? Uh, yeah. But I thought that was a fascinating thing. Anyway, we didn't come to talk about the eclipse, no. but I'm glad that we are. We came to talk about your folks' questions. Um, first of all, well, okay, I was Scott is, is somebody's trying to invade his office, and so uh, he's he's going and taking care of that right now. I hope I hope he's okay. He's back. Every, everything all right? Was like the UPS guy got a little too friendly getting in the house, or what happened? Sorry, no, no, no the, the kids just got home, so I had to tell them to go downstairs. So I apologize. That was just bad timing. No, it's great. This is this is this is parenting when you have a podcast. It's please leave me alone. I I, I don't care if you've been gone all day. Um, <laughs> but I love you, Grace. Well, Scott, Scott, we have a yeah, we have a we have a beef from uh, one of our folks on Twitter with you. Uh, Howie says, "Can you get Scott to stop referring to last year's portal class as a home run?" I feel like we got halfway there last time. When after saying we got where, so this year we need two top five guys to be better off. Uh, Woodson finally seemed to acknowledge that fit matters. So uh, I'll, I'll support Scott in this, Howie. I think it's fair to say that the where signing was a home run, but we, we didn't win the portal last year. Uh, so I think there's a differentiation there between saying that the where signing was a home run and the overall portal experience for IU last year was a home run. Is that what you meant to say? Or do you really mean, do you think that the whole portal experience was a home run last year? I, I think so. I think it's a home run. And what I mean is like, to me, Mbako is part of the portal experience. Like in the off season. He's, he's not part of the, that's a recruit though. That's not the portal. No, I know, but that's okay. I mean, all right. Then, then I should, all right. The off season overall was a home run in that you get that. I don't think you're ever going to see a, us or most schools get you know two of the top five people in a portal class it just seems very unlikely to happen to me what i was saying is that you get one of the top five portal guys you get two other guys you know, anthony walker a kid coming off a final four team you have peyton sparks a you know local you know regional m solid you know mid-level player to pieces to put together and then i i do include Mbako in that as like a five-star transfer so maybe i should rephrase it as like a home run off season to me that's as good as you can do in an off season. I, I kind of view the five star, you know, re recruitment people at this point as portal adjacent, we'll call it. But that that's my mm -hmm. overall feeling is that for an off season, that's about as good as you're going to get. Maybe it's not like an absolute grand slam, but to me, that's a really good off season. My point is we haven't hit that yet. And it's just like, we did that and it wasn't good enough the idea of, and this goes to what you and I always talk about, the idea of like, we just got to do better. It's like, that's, you know, when you take the totality, good word for this week, of, mm -hmm. of the off season, to me, it's like, you can't say last season, what you got was like a C minus. Like you got really a, a lot of good pieces. My, I guess my greater point is the idea of us just, we have to do better than that seems really unlikely to me. It's like, we got to do better with the pieces we get. But I guess that that's clarif clarification around it, and I am including Mbako in that. So I should say off season and not portal. And I, I hear that. That's a. I think that's a fair clarification, and I think your larger point is a good one. That it's like you're going to be hard pressed to do as well, right? In the overall off season, and you could say, well, Bryson Tucker. There's your Mackenzie Mbako analog. I don't know if that's really. I'm not sure if Bryson Tucker will provide the same kind of thing that Mbako did. But certainly getting someone of Ware's caliber, you're, you're kind of having to live up to that expectation, plus having to sign a starting point guard. That's a, that is going to be a really fascinating uh, task to see how Indiana handles that. It actually dovetails with another question that we got from Indibama or Indibama. Um, what's the magic hey, formula hey, to getting? Hey, hey Nate, hey, Nate. Hey, Nate. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Nate, <laughs> Nate you up? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, what's the magic formula for getting completely unrelated portal transfers, expecting starter playing time and close knit returning IU starters to gel together in a scheme that hasn't produced and resulting in wins and setting up the program for the future? And, and yes, that was a run on sentence. So I think there's don't stages. Ask Pitino. Here. Don't ask. Don't ask this for Rick Pitino. He doesn't know. The worst, worst experience of my life, Scott. <laughs> um, no, the um, OK, so I think there's a couple of different stages there. You. 
And this was brought up, I think, by Jared uh, from Assembly Call, or it was maybe Coach Tonsoni uh, on a show they did like last week or two weeks ago. Where it's like, you know, you can kind of broadly say, well, we're just going to get the best players, figure out who the best players are, then figure out what system we want to utilize, and then try to, you know, and, and I guess hope that the culture gels. Or you can try to go the culture route and say, well, we need to get complementary pieces from a personnel perspective and see if we can grow them into roles that operate within the structure that we want to utilize. I, I think it's really, I think you got to kind of, Got, you've got to kind of do one or the other. I don't know that you can do both. You you might be able to pull off both, but that would be tremendously lucky, I think, in the eyes of, of you know college basketball because, as we've seen, and one of the things that we talked about on the Q&A yesterday and a little bit on when we talked on Sunday, Scott, is this idea that culture is so important. And even though – IU players have clearly closed ranks and have kind of put whatever differences there appear to be on the court beside or behind them. Um, realistically, culture was a bit of an issue last year. Culture was certainly an issue, I think, in the Archie Miller era. Like, it never felt like those teams properly gelled. And I think you saw that last year quite a bit. Now, you got a little bit of gelling at the end, but you're also losing the point guard that you said was the linchpin of everything. And you're losing the center that was, you know, your primary force on on offense and defense by the end of the year. Um, I don't know that there's a, you know, is there a secret sauce for making that happen or a magic formula? I I don't think there is. I think you've got to get good players because if you've got average players who blend together well, I don't think that the remaining pieces that are on this team are necessarily good enough to get you in the top half of the Big Ten by themselves. But I think that the other aspect is you, you're you going to have to take some things on faith with some of the, the higher rated players because you're not going to be able to necessarily filter for culture. And that's that's the way the open market works when it comes to this transfer portal. You don't have the luxury of just picking and choosing. Uh, if you're Indiana, you've really got to be purposeful in what you think is most important and hope that the other stuff falls into place. I mean, where I think Indiana has a problem is – and I'm just going to assume this is the case. You know, Mike Woodson seems to have a system that he wants to play basketball under. That's fine. You can have that, and that's great. The, the trouble is that also that that limits the number of people you can get in the portal because we're saying there was a culture problem. There was kind of like a fit of you're asking players to do things they really can't do because you you need them to fit into your system. And you can have a system is fine, but it's it's if you're going to do a lot in the portal, which we're going to have to do, you know you're going to get only half the kids in the portal are probably guys who can play in the Mike Woodson system. It's no knock on the system. It's just in any system. Like if, if Purdue needed six guys in the system, it's like Matt Painter has a very specific system that he needs players. Now he recruits for it. He builds for it in, in programs that kind of have a self-defined system. The portal is great when you're getting a piece here, a piece there, and you can kind of plug them in the idea that we need to get this many pieces into the portal is tough because the other option is, you know, well, then then you might need a, you know, a, a, a system that's much more flexible. Like a coach is just going to, we're going to, we're going to see the pieces we have, and I'm going to build my system around the pieces I have. We don't seem to have that. And so that that's where I get concerned is you need to get six people. Like we've talked about, two of them need to be high level, but they also need to be guys who will be able to do exactly what you need them to do. And there's some players who just are not going to be fits based on the system that you're running. And it's like, I just wonder if you're kind of self, you're making the selection process so small that you only have a couple guys you can go after. And that's where I get concerned um, with what we're doing. But I, I think that's part of the problem is we have a pretty inflexible system that we're playing basketball under, which in and of itself, again, isn't bad, but it is very tough when you need to get half your team in a three week period of guys who also fit the system you want to play. Let's move on to the next question. Um, we had a question. I know there's one you in particular want to get to. We will get to that in a, in a second. Um, so this is one I was going to say for like a solo pod, um, but I, I'll go ahead and ask it while you're here. Robbie Malcolm. Yeah. Robbie Malcolmson asks, there are many justifiable criticisms to the transfer portal. However, as a challenge, can you defend the current portal and what it has to offer the average coach, athlete, and university? So I'll say this, and I'm, people have listened to the show for a while have heard me say this before. You can, 
you can be critical of the way the transfer portal operates and how it fits within the confines of college basketball. I think that that's fair in as much as it is a sea change of epic proportions from how we used to do business. You know, transfers were very rare. Um, certainly multiple time transfers were non-existent essentially, except in incredibly special cases. It's led to a lot of uncertainty year to year about rosters. The, the key thing that is the defense of the transfer portal is that colleges and universities engaged in high level collegiate athletics have forever argued that athletes are just students, that they're not like a special class, that they're not employees, none of that. Well, there's not really any justifiable argument for having students, which is what the colleges and universities have argued that the athletes are, not be able to move from school to school like any other student can. As, as I'll say, like if I'm if I have a student in my class right now who's going here, but they really, after thinking about it, really think that they'd be happier at, uh, you know, back home at Illinois, you know, University of Illinois. They can just leave IU and go to Illinois. And as long as they get accepted by Illinois and can transfer classes and they can go play there or go start to go, go start classes there. Why should that be any different? If you're going to classify athletes as students at the collegiate level, why should the rules be any different for them? Um, the other thing I'll say is that the reason the transfer portal exists is because colleges and universities know that if they try to restrict movement of, of athletes now, they'll get sued and they'll lose because there's no real justification for it. Do coaches like that? No. Do athletic directors like that? No. But guess who has the ability, the ability to change it right now? Colleges and universities, the NCAA. That is the membership of the NCAA. This isn't just some random judgment or some random decision that was handed down. This is specifically what the membership is allowing to happen. They could change the rules. They could make the movement of players a lot more professional in nature. There's a ton of things they could be doing. Do they do those things? No. And so I have a hard time, like really, I understand why fans don't like it, but this is the system that colleges and universities have claimed that they've been using for a long time. So if you're mad about it, you need to get on your local like board of trustees or athletic director or what have you and say, why don't we change the rules and why don't we make it a little bit more equitable for the players and you sign them to contracts, employment contracts. Well, now they can't move. I mean, did you ever wonder why there's not like a transfer portal in the NFL? It's because they have a collective bargaining agreement. It's because there are rules about here's how much we're going to pay you. And here's how long the contract is. And if we cut you, here's how much money you get, if any, like that's how sports are supposed to work. And so that would be what I would say to people who don't like the portal. I don't like some of the things it's done especially to football and basketball, but this is what you said you were doing for years as a as an entity, the NCAA, and so welcome to reality. I look at it kind of like a stock bubble where you have all of this pent-up energy. of you know, For so long, people haven't been able to move or transfer like you mentioned, and now it's like it, it, it kind of is being blown out, and I think it's good. You know, the, the thing that I think is funny, and these are single cases, but you know, I look at the transfer portal as – a real benefit for coaches and programs that have their S together. And so you look at, a pro, you know, the two teams that just played for the national championship, Purdue and Connecticut, Connecticut had some turnover. A lot of those guys went to the NBA, but you had a lot of, you know, some of the pieces from last year's team and this year's team, Purdue, it's almost the entire team back. And it's a very unique circumstance, but it's like this talk of like, Oh my gosh, all you're going to get, you know, it's, it's funny when people are like, I hate the men's game. None of the same players are there. And it's like all the, all this change and difference. Like, well, Purdue has been here for two years. They look pretty the same next year. I think they're going to look pretty like there's a lot of teams that do have a lot of consistency. And it does feel like if you're a coach who builds a good program and has things kind of loaded in correctly, the portal is a great spot to get a couple pieces here and there and keep growing I do think where it's tough is where you, if you have programs that are not well maintained or not well, you know, put together in the past, it's like, well, you could just kind of keep the pieces you had and kind of have this fiefdom. Now everybody can leave and you can, you get a little more free market in here and it makes the job a lot tougher for coaches who are not doing a good job. And personally, I don't feel bad for any of them. Like you just don't get to get somebody for four years because you signed them early. Um, so I, I like it, and I think you're seeing, you know, we just had back-to-back -back national champions. It's not like this is going to be a crapshoot every year and you re-roll the dice. It's like you're starting, like, people are like, man, Connecticut's going to go forever. It's like, well, I thought the the big thing of the portal was like, you're never, teams are never going to stay together. You're never going to get consistency. It's like we almost seem to have more of it now in the portal era. So I think it's it, it makes it harder for the mediocre coaches, and that's why they don't like it. But I think for the coaches who are good, 
it actually makes it better. And you might see even more dynasty building in the portal era than we saw in the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, sometimes it's not that, you know, I mean, some of it is players don't want to sit around. They want to get playing time. Uh, this is this is how it works. Um, I think a lot of people that don't like the portal in football or basketball, um, you know, look, so many players got stashed for two or three years until the coach was ready to play them. And now there's movement. There's freedom of movement. Of course, people are going to utilize that. If you don't like it, I understand, but that's why you have to make them employees. Like, you, that you have to pay them. Like the idea that, well, we're going to give you this scholarship, but and you're but you're really here to play sports and you know it and we know it, but we're not going to play you until we're ready to play you. I mean, it's just not, I know that that's what most of college sports was based on, but it's also very different from how the rest of the sporting world operates. You know, when, and again, I'll use like European soccer as an example, like you can sign players, but you're going to loan them out and have them play at other places. So they continue to get better, not just so they, you, you don't get significantly better unless you're playing regularly against other competition. And that is, I think, an important aspect to all of this. There are many other models that could be utilized that would make a lot more sense than the transfer portal model, but it would require a different financial model to go well, along and, with and just, anyway. just to use the NBA as an example, it's like the Pacers have Jairus Walker, who they signed. Like, they're not playing him a ton, which I have concerns about, but it's like – they're playing him in the G League and they're playing him in other areas. They're not stashing him as much, but they're also paying him, you know, the league and the NBA Players Association agreed on a salary structure for, you know, for first year players. He's making like 6.7 million this year. And it's like, that's, that is his job. And they either likes it or he doesn't, but it's like, he's going to make, you know, 7 million next year, whether they stash him or they don't. And it's okay. And to your point, you make them employees. And it's like, then you decide whether you want to be stashed on an Alabama or not but you're going to get compensated for it. And right now it's just, this is complete free market. You had a question you wanted us to hit. So why don't we go to that one? Do you have the text of it up there or do I need to find it? Um, if um, I can have it here in a sec. I think let's do, uh, we'll do some Scott searching for the, the question music. How about that? Let's see if we can get some. There we okay, go. Here we go. Uh, this is from Luke. Oh. There we go. I, dude, I'm let's just keep this on actually. Yeah, go ahead. It was great. Uh, can you explain to the younger audience that Bob Knight was Dan Hurley before Dan Hurley was Dan Hurley? Uh, the different eras, different rules, but same results. Um, so, you know what? I think where this comes from is what you saw, or my version of where I think where this comes from is what you saw with UConn the other night playing Purdue was their offense was just terrific. I mean, to the point that it almost looks like, you know, you're running a new style of offense. And I, I, I do think there are some pieces there where, UConn's offense is so crisp, so clean compared to every other, but everybody else seeing college basketball, there are some night corollaries there. Um, the thing that I'll say with night, as I thought about this a little bit more, I'm going to take it a bit of a different angle, but the thing with night is that, you know, basketball was so different before Bob Knight came in. It's almost stone age to not, it's like, you know, they were playing, North Carolina was playing four corners. They'd get up, you know, 24 to 20 and then just have four dudes go to every corner of the, of the, the court and just hold the ball and pass it around. Um, you know, Knight came in and revolutionized defense and revolutionized offense. Where I took this, though, and started thinking, and I remember us talking about this a bit during, the, you know, when, when Knight passed away last October, but I really pulled it out here. You know, people looked at Dan Hurley. It's like, my God, he just won back-to-back -back titles, and they're they're on pace to kill it at UConn. The thing with Hurley is he's 51 years old, um, and he's won two titles. This is the thing with Knight that, like, you talk about a savant. Like, Knight, in 1976, when he won a title with an undefeated team, was 36 years old. 30. 35. 35. I was doing 1976 minus 40. So 35. Well, saying, he was he, he was born like November 1st, I think. Or the very 35. When he was 30, he left Army. I got a couple things here with a record of 102 and 50. When he's 35, before the season he won a title, he's 34, 35. Here's his record: 195 and 70. That's good for 73 percent winning percentage, kids. With a Final Four, a CCAT championship, and an Elite Eight. So if you look at coaches who have won, you know, a title that young, it doesn't exist. You know, Wooden was 54 years old. Coach K was 44 years old. Coach K was 45 when he won his second. Knight was 40 
when he won 81, when he won two. He was 45 when he won his third. The only person in his universe is honestly Billy Donovan. Billy Donovan won his first at 41 and then a, you know back to back, won his second at 42. But at 42, Knight was Whoa. basically on the path to getting two. Like, so to me, no knock on Dan Hurley. Like what Dan Hurley is doing with that team, there are pieces of that offense that are great to see. But to me, that's the thing with Knight that I think gets forgotten because Knight turned old very quickly. Like by 84, 85, he suddenly had a sweater and the gray hair. Like he just, he looked old and you and I grew up when it's just like Knight was that older figure. Like he's so damn young when he won his first title. It's unbelievable. Oh. It's funny because, and I, I may be wrong, there might be an individual who is younger, but the other coach who had that ridiculous amount of success that young is Branch McCracken, who won a title at th age 32, went to war, served in the military for three years, yeah, came back. Had the, 40. No, he was, he was born in 1908. Okay, sorry, sorry. So he was born June 9th, 1908. So so he was actually 31. I'm sorry, he wasn't 32 when he won the title. So, But then what left for the Army, had to rebuild the program essentially from scratch, won another title in 1953 when he's only, what, 44 years old. Um, it, is, it is interesting to think about how unique IU has been placed in having young coaches like that. But And Hurley's a great example. Like, he's, he's younger than Painter, but just barely um, – you know, I think Brad Stevens is younger than him. But what's fascinating to me, and, and where I think the comps with Hurley tonight are more direct, A, Hurley is, like, clearly a maniac, and he he talks shit in press conferences, he yells at officials, he kind of acts in a way that most coaches don't. And like push he gets away with it play during the game. Yeah. I mean, that was, I just, I mean, you know, an average, even if Knight had done that, I think, well, especially in his later year, 98, we'd be front page of SI. But, <laughs> but, but, but the fact that Hurley does it, I, even I was like, that's actually really endearing. That's, that was, that was great to see Hurley's ability. I think, you know, the, 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 the talking and the way he uses the press and the way that he battles officials, the way he backed those officials down from, from calling a Zach Eady game they, the way they normally call a Zach Eady game. I mean, all of that is very reminiscent of Knight. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. There's a there's some really prominent people who I text back and forth with who say the same thing. But the thing that gets me about Hurley is, I mean, it's hard to lead a basketball revolution uh, at the college level right now, but his preparation for other teams and his the way that he gets his staff to work on things – his ability to pick exactly the right players to fill the spots in his system. And this run that they've been on now for the last two years, it is all of those things in combination are incredibly reminiscent to me of what Bob Knight did here from like 1973 to 1976, which should have culminated in two back-to-back -back national titles, but obviously didn't because of what happened in 75. So yes, I think if you're out there and you have any sense of IU history or Bob Knight history, and you're like, you know what? That that Dan Hurley really is reminiscent of Bob Knight. You're you're not off base by any means. You you are exactly right, and I think it's a really fascinating thing to watch. And it's just a shame that he's at UConn. I mean, I'm really happy for UConn that they've got him. But man, um, it's what what's annoying is that Dan Hurley was there for the taking for a bunch of programs sitting there at Rhode Island, and it's like everybody dawdled. I don't know if he would have gone a whole lot of other places. He seems to really like the Northeast. His wife seems to really like the Northeast, but it, it makes you wonder. You really do scratch your head. And I'm not just talking about Indiana. I'm talking about a bunch of other programs. It's like, man, that you're talking about, you know, much like Indiana hiring Knight after Wisconsin missed on him, Notre Dame could have had him. He wanted Knight wanted to go to Notre Dame and they, they didn't have a coaching vacancy and Indiana jumped on it. I mean, it, it's one of those sliding doors moments that doesn't just affect that program, but affects the entirety of college basketball. And not to get too night, but where, where we could see the difference is, you know, the, the age thing I think affected night in that he had so much success so early. And I, I still say, I mean, he had, he had Larry bird on campus after the 76 title team. So there's a world where like, if he gets that it was right before it was yeah, before 75, bird, yeah, bird, like, bird left, bird left in 74. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But I mean, he, he able to, identify that and keep that as a world where he keeps it. But Knight had so much success. I don't want to go down this road, but like so much success so early oh. that, that, you know, he gets to a point where he's kind of like, 
all right, I did it. What else is there to do? And he kind of gets in this mode of like, I want a title. Like I'm going to go hunt for a year. And I'm, I'm being very, very broad, but it's like Hurley feels like he might be maniac enough to go like, I'm going to try and win five, six, seventies. Not that Knight wasn't trying, but Knight kind of would do it. And then like put his feet up. And it's like, can I autopilot to one more than he couldn't? And it's like, I'm going to go get Isaiah Thomas. I'll win. One. Like, he's like, all right, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm screw this. I'm getting back into it. Like, and I think that's part of the savant piece of night where it's like, he knew he was so good. He could just activate yeah. Voltron and just do it. But he, he, there was a part of night where he would just kind of go fishing for a year. It felt like, and I'm mm. not sure Hurley's going to do that. Night, two things about that. And then we'll wrap up this episode. Yeah. A night, uh, for those who know the story, Knight famously almost walked away from coaching yeah. entirely in 1981 after that 81 title and went and he almost became the lead studio analyst for CBS for basketball and CBS to the point that CBS checks the family. It's like Bill Raffi still has a job. Thanks to that. You know, I mean, but, but CBS thought they had him. And the only reason that Knight really came back was because Landon Turner gets in the accident that summer uh, after the, the, the title. And, you know, so that's important to keep in mind is that that mentality. I mean, at that point, Knight was, was 40, you know, about to turn 41, and I think he's looking for a. I know it's just wild, but he's looking at it, looking for a second act at that point. Um, his second act ends up being back here at Indiana. But I've always felt, you know, with with the not just the way that Knight like really held forward. We're gonna we're gonna follow the NCAA rules here at Indiana. Like, yes, some of that was principle, but a lot of that was Knight to some degree. I think tying one hand behind his back to see if he could succeed under those guidelines. You know, and and so many things he refused to do and then eventually had to kind of go back on. Like, we're not going to recruit junior college players. Well, hey, he goes and recruits two junior college yeah. players and they end up winning the title in 87. Uh, but a lot of it was also like what you said. And you saw this phase with him in the early 80s after the, the 81 title. You saw this phase in the 90s, which is really what led to his downfall in terms of on-court success. He'd leave the recruiting to the assistants and the assistants weren't picking players that fit his system and his mentality and he's to blame for that. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying, like, a lot of that ends up coming back to this idea that Knight was, um, much like Hurley, one of those guys who clearly, like, has made the game easy for himself and can make it easy for others. You do run the risk with those types of coaches after a while. It's like, what is the challenge here? Right. Like, what what am I really measuring myself up against? And what what else could I be doing? And you, so, and you saw it, you, the, the connection to UConn, you saw it the other night where it's just like, I watched that game. It's like how, and I don't, I don't watch a ton of Big East. I'm like, how the hell did UConn lose this year? <laughs> just watching them play, and it's like just watching them through the tournament. And, and again, that he's yeah. Hurley's doing a great job of getting this team focused at the right time. But you look at this team, and it's like, Jesus, I don't, I don't know how you beat this team. Like if, if you have Edie, who, who has is his own unique talent, it's like they just they had a game plan. They they figured out. Even we're watching the game, and I love my wife. She's like, God, they have a great game plan for Edie. It's like you're watching this. And it's it just jumps off the page. Um, how, how good they are and just how crisp and efficient they are. And you're like, I can't believe they ever lose. Anyway, that'll wrap it up for uh, part two of the Q&A. We really appreciate you folks uh, joining us. We'll be back, I think, with a part three. Might just be me, but we'll see how that goes. Anyway, thanks, Scott. As always, a pleasure to talk to you during the middle of the day. Thanks to all you folks out there. Thanks to our friends at the Back Home Network and Home Field Apparel, our presenting sponsor. Back with more podcasting coming up soon. For Scott, I'm Galen. This is Crimson Cast. We'll catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. So long, everybody.